Hello class. Um, as you can see, um, we're going to be a little non-traditional today. Uh, I'm coming to you from the Satellite Beach Public Library where um, I'm currently visiting for um, a death in the family, funeral arrangements and all that. So I apologize that we're having to have class like this, but um, the zombie came up, death is an rhetorical exigence, and uh, we're going to make do with what we have. Um, luckily, I have a study room. I've got a whiteboard, so I have my notes, although they're backwards for you. Um, and also, this is a bit weird because um, the study room has windows, so I might have an audience uh, that isn't y'all for once. Uh, I apologize if the audio is sort of weird or if I'm too loud, uh, given the sort of acoustics of this, but um, thank you for bringing with me, and hopefully this shouldn't be too crazy. Um, so today we're continuing our sort of discussion of Foucault. Uh, we talked last week about the history of sexuality and how um, ideological state apparatuses function to create sort of deviance, right? Um, so when we flip to the Panopticon, this idea of um, how prisons and surveillance uh, manifest in something like prisons, but also um, going sort of widespread to a culture, we're really looking more at um, repressive state apparatuses. That we're talking about um, sort of violent repression or repression of bodies and really some of the mechanisms that keep such a power structure in place, that uh, sort of looming threat of physical punishment via um, law, the courts, uh, prison system, so on and so forth. So, we're going to talk about um, the Panopticon as Foucault describes it as a sort of structure, but then he sort of expands that to be a metaphor um, for a kind of panopticism in culture where we're really talking about something where um, we don't know if we're being watched, but we just sort of assume that we do all the time. And as such, we tend to um, behave or, or follow laws. And, and we'll talk about a bunch of different examples. But um, that's sort of where we're headed. That's the big picture. Uh, and so I hope this sort of works. Like I said, I apologize for the logistics. So first things first, before we're talking about the Panopticon as a structure, we have to understand a little bit of history about uh, the prison in general. I talked last week about uh, Foucault's sort of big push here is a transition away from punishments of the body, very uh, public torture, um, hangings, executions, things like that, very physical. You know, if you ever heard the phrase, a pound of flesh, people would literally do that. They would sort of put them out in, in the public and ex extract a literal pound of their flesh, and that was meant to be a punishment, right? But uh, for Foucault, there's a major transition when we move to prisons where it's a punishment of the mind. And believe it or not, um, the prison as we know it is a uniquely American invention. Um, if any of you have ever heard of the Quakers, the um, nonviolent, uh, pacifist sort of religious uh, Christian sect based in Pennsylvania originally, I believe. Pennsylvania is a Quaker colony. Um, they believe in silence, reflection, and prayer and worship. And so if you go to a Quaker service, it's often very meditative and quiet. Um, and out of the Quaker religion comes this idea of penitence, um, wherein you are repenting and you do that through silent uh, sort of reflection and worship and prayer. And so um, it was out of those beliefs that the Quakers conceived of a space called a penitentiary, wherein um, those who are being punished for a crime uh, basically are, are punished via this kind of silent penitence and reflection. And so um, one of the, the architectural models for very early penitentiaries, I believe the Pennsylvania State Penitentiary is very, very old, I think it's a museum now, um, was laid out in such a fashion, similar to the Panopticon. And here's what it looks like. Um, you have sort of a perimeter of, you know, just the whole building is sort of a circle. And then there's a circle within that. And each of the cells in this prison is really sort of divided up like this. So it works in such a way that every person is in their own cells and they can only look forward. There might be a window so they can see outwards. 
Um, maybe, maybe not, depends. But the idea of this is they can only look forward to this sort of serene, plas not plastic, this serene sort of greenery landscape. And it's that idea of being silent. There was a, a strict code of silence in Quaker penitentiary so, uh, so that you could get that sort of redemption that their religious beliefs espouse. And so it's out of this that we really uh, see the, the idea of a prison as a whole develop in the early Americas. Um, Foucault really takes up this idea uh, via the ideas of, of a man named Jeremy Bentham, who dis designed something called the Panopticon. So you have a similar model, but rather than sort of a green space in the middle, you have a watchtower. And so this already looks like an eyeball, but I'm going to throw an eyeball in here. So, the Panopticon as a structure, I know you probably can't see that, um, but this is the guard tower in the center. That's what distinguishes this sort of early American prison to, from the Panopticon, where you have a guard tower here, right? Um, and generally speaking, the idea is that there's always going to be someone watching what's going on in these cells, making sure that uh, prisoners are talking to one another, that they are breaking the rules, that they aren't doing anything that they shouldn't be doing other than being punished, right? Um, but where it gets interesting is, is when we start sort of elaborating on this um, in terms of what this means for power and what power looks like in a panopticon structure. Uh, if you're interested in this idea, the Illinois State Penitentiary in Joliet, I believe, is actually designed to be a panopticon. So you can look up photos of that. Uh, you can see in the, the doc, the word doc that we read, there's a photo of a panopticon from sort of the side view. This is a top view. Um, but really what we're looking at is how this starts to function in practice, theoretically. And that's sort of what Bentham sketches out and then Foucault elaborates on that by showing what it looks like in practice. And as a result, there are a few things that the Panopticon does for power. Uh, I'll make these notes available to y'all, that way you can sort of refer back and forth to see what it is I'm talking about. So, the idea behind this is, all of these prisoners are in a constant state of surveillance. They know that they are being watched by someone in the guard tower. Um, therefore, Whoever is going to be in these cells are going to behave, they're going to follow regulations, they're going to follow rules, so on and so forth. Um, what this ends up doing for power is, specifically how they're designed, you don't actually know if there's someone in the uh, guard tower or not, um, because it's designed in such a way that like you can see but there might be like reflective mirrors or something So you only see yourself or there's going to be blinds. There's going to be these sort of weird architectural tricks um, to Basically obstruct your view. You never know if you're actually being watched But you have to sort of assume that you're going to because if you do something wrong You might get away with it. Somebody's in there, maybe not um, But you keep doing things wrong eventually you're going to be punished. So uh, what this does is basically instills an assumption within inmates that they are being watched and therefore they should behave at all times. Um, which is really where we're headed. So on the one hand, the panopticon makes power efficient. And I know you can't read this because it's going to be backwards, but it helps me to write it. So efficiency in terms of Theoretically, you could have eight floors of the Panopticon with, you know, a dozen, two dozen, three dozen, whatever you want, and only have like one guard tower or, or, or one person manning that or not. As I said, um, the idea is you're building the, the assumption that they're being watched, whether or not they actually are. But in the end, in terms of like labor efficiency, you have to uh, employ so many fewer guards because they're centrally located in this tower. So it makes power efficient. Um, next, it makes it automatic. And that's what I'm talking about when I talk about the assumption that someone is watching. Whether or not, again, in terms of labor efficiency, not only do you employ less people, you could theoretically have them for fewer hours a week because once this system has uh, 
been around or, 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 or been active long enough, anyone in these cells is going to assume they're being watched. Um, and as such, you don't actually have to have anyone be there. It's sort of automatic. Um, and it isn't in the guard as much as it is, is in this entire system. I mean, we all sort of play our part, play our role, according to Foucault. So efficient and automatic are the first two. Next, power becomes anonymous. And so going back to this idea that anybody could be in there or not, um, Foucault makes the point that even if it wasn't the warden of the prison, it could be his brother, it could be his mother, it could be his sister, it could be his son, it could be his daughter, it could be his dog, as long as you teach it how to pull a lever and punish someone, right? Uh, it's this idea that anyone is able to wield power and you don't might not ever recognize or know who it is if you are a prisoner in this system. If you end up being punished, you don't know who it was that ultimately was going to either cut you doing something wrong or saw you doing something wrong and ends up having you punished via whatever systems are in place. Um, finally, and this is where it starts to get interesting, um, on the one hand, this is these are all functions of the building itself, but the last point is that power becomes self-perpetuating. And so, um, thinking back to Althusser, where a lot of what we're talking about is how um, economic systems and ideologies reinforce and reinscribe and reperpetuate themselves, essentially. And in sort of imbuing through a panopticon building or a structure, um, this power becomes self perpetuating. And what I mean by that is, a prisoner who's, let's say, prisoner A in this cell has been here for five years. And prisoner B has been here for you know, three years. Doesn't really matter. Um, but then C, you know, three weeks at most. Um, what ends up happening is since these inmates who have been in the system in the panopticon for so much longer they've internalized this sort of state of being of surveillance so that they might actually begin policing the person who has been in for three weeks so it's the idea that um, at that point the inmates are acting more like guards than anyone in the guard tower this idea that um, the surveillance, the power, the punishment, this entire system becomes imbued into the citizens themselves to the point that they will become agents of this power, whether or not they know it. Um, so on the one hand, you could frame it as being like, they're looking out for fellow citizens, whatever it might be. But uh, as Foucault frames it, it is much more that they are perpetuating power and they are acting on behalf of their captors, essentially, making sure that um, this discipline and this order is kept within the prison system. Um, does that make sense? I know you can't answer, but uh, force a habit. So as a kind of overview for this structure, A, it is a very real concrete thing, right? And Foucault sort of extrapolates these four attributes of power that such a system of surveillance uh, housed in a building allows. It becomes efficient, meaning you can employ less people. Um, it becomes automatic, and uh, automatic in terms of, sorry, no one has to be there. Like I said, it's, it's something that um, can function with or without guards, as long as they're inmates to be controlled or to be contained. Um, anonymous, meaning anyone can do this, and finally self-perpetuating. Not only in terms of anyone being able to do it, but the idea that this system, this ideology, this belief becomes so imbued in the citizens, or the inmates in this case, that they will take up that mantle of surveillance and use it to police one another, essentially. Um, so, all that's well and good, we can think of this as, you know, just this one structure, right, contained to one building 
for one very specific class of people, uh, those who have violated the law. Although Foucault does note that this can be used in hospitals, it can be used in schools, it could be used in uh, mental institutions, all the different areas and, and uh, ideological state apparatuses that we've discussed previously. Um, but it's just so uh, happens that it's applied most often in uh, the penal system. But this becomes much more interesting when we begin to consider this building, this structure as a metaphor wherein we're moving away from um, the panopticon as structure to um, what he calls panopticism, uh, and specifically panopticism within culture. So, this is the idea that we take these principles of surveillance within this architectural structure and it becomes dispersed, not just contained within this one building, but it becomes dispersed within uh, various mechanisms of culture. And, and really what he's talking about is like ISAs, because if you look at the examples of panopticism he talks about, on the one hand, it's Christian schools. And he also talks about the police becoming mechanisms of surveillance. And that makes sense. And, and we'll talk about more examples as we move forward. But um, if we look at panopticism at, or panopticon as a structure, it functions primarily through uh, surveillance and the assumption of surveillance to the point that inmates are policing each other, right? Take this out of the prison and start dispersing it through culture, through something like schools, through something like church, through like something through family, through business, um, any and all of these things. Then we start to see panopticism in culture. Um, so we can sort of start with the examples that he talks about. Um, but let's walk it back. Um, a very, very easy example, very, very uh, palatable example, something that doesn't seem so uh, doom and gloom as all of this is, uh, I imagine when most of us were children, we were told that there was this fat, jolly man in the sky who um, he sees you when you're sleeping, knows when you're awake, and he knows whether you've been bad or good, right? Um, this is a, a mechanism of surveillance via Santa Claus, right? Um, so Santa Claus, I know you can't see that, um, really is like a very, very early childhood example of this kind of mechanism of surveillance, of panopticism. The idea that if we're going to get all them good toys and our candy and food and what have you, um, we have to behave, we have to be good kids, we have to listen to our parents, we have to be good in school, we have to get good grades, blah, 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 blah. Um, so that this fat man will bring us toys, right? Um, so that's, that's an easy, cutesy, palatable example, but actually kind of sinister in that we're training children, kids, um, to this sort of condition of surveillance very early in their lives, right? Um, Another example is the Easter Bunny uh, coming up next week, right? Uh, tooth Fairy a little bit, but you just sort of lose your teeth. I don't think that's as strong, but uh, that's sort of an example of panopticism and how it disperses through culture, right? Um, but let's look to his examples that he actually talks about for Co. On the one hand, we have his example of old Christian schools, and to a degree this might still happen. Uh, I know we've talked about examples of like teenage pregnancy and um, potentially gay marriage or gay families uh, that may or may not end up being sort of centripetally handled by a particular uh, church community. But the example here, and this happens in public schools too, it's not just Christian schools, he's just using an, an historical example where, um, you know, teachers, principals, staff of school uh, have within their purview of power to monitor parents' activities as well. Um, 
So you can think of an example of like a public school where in a child is being abused or neglected at home, a teacher uh, can take it upon themselves to sort of intervene or, or call child services. And these are good things, right? This is a kind of surveillance that we can see um, having a positive net benefit, right? The example that Foucault gives with Christian schools would be like, um, you know, little Johnny has two dads or two moms, therefore he cannot be in, uh, cannot gain attendance or gain, cannot enroll in a Christian school, right? Uh, so it's this idea of mechanisms of education being able to not only monitor their children and make sure they're behaving within the walls of the school, but also that their parents and family structure um, reflect a particular sort of moral view or, or set of beliefs, right? So on the one hand, that's one way in which surveillance is dispersed through social networks, not just centralized and located within one building, right? His next example is police, wherein um, yeah, this is a sort of historical example that he gives, the development of police wherein magistrates were um, concerned with upholding laws of kings, right? And you have all of these uh, sort of centripetal forces, physical repressive kinds of things being consolidated under the auspices of a police force. Um, so you can, can think about all of the uh, powers of surveillance as well as like search and seizure that police and law enforcement have. So you have something like search warrants um, as well as uh, like searching of cars, searching of people, and even, uh, and you know, this is, continues to be a sort of legal debate is like access to web activity. And I want to put a pin in web activity because I think that's the most sort of prescient and pertinent example to us, right? But thinking about how um, police end up having that sort of dispersed network of surveillance. You might also think of Sherlock Holmes, if you're a fan, um, the Banker Street Rats, where he relies on the kids as his sort of um, ears to the ground, he sort of collects gossip and all of that to really uh, inform his sort of investigation and detective work. That's a mechanism or a network of surveillance that um, law enforcement have available. Criminal informants is a different sort of uh, take on the same thing, right? Um, so we're beginning to see how, again, these two things cross over to be cultural elements uh, that are dispersed and carried out by a, uh, a very large network of social institutions and individuals. Uh, the example I like to use with police as well are the red light cameras, which um, we don't have in Tallahassee anymore. But oftentimes it's this idea that um, we don't turn right on red, we don't run a red light because there are these very visible um, mechanisms of surveillance, like the cameras at traffic lights. Um, kind of trying to apply the four factors over here. Uh, on the one hand, it is efficient because we have a camera instead of a police person. It's automatic because it's a uh, machine. Anonymous because the camera isn't a person, so it's just a thing. Uh, and self-perpetuating, the idea that you might stop your friend and be like, whoa, they have a light here, they have a, a camera, don't do that. Um, you're actually starting to monitor one another, right? Uh, same thing with Santa Claus. If you can think back to your elementary school kids, or your, your time there, if you uh, had these kinds of conversations where you might try to stop of a friend from doing something bad or from getting in trouble close to Christmas, um, because you don't want you know, Santa Claus to not bring you thing, you don't want a lump of coal, right? Um, so this idea of self-perpetuating, and that's how we're starting to see not only how this spreads out, but this becomes something, these four characteristics, we can start to apply to our behaviors within culture. Um, and so this does, I think, become relevant when we start thinking about um, mass surveillance of the web, wherein, um, so we have things like NSA, um, 
wherein uh, due to whistleblowers like Ed Snowden, uh, we know that in NSA, if you are flagged as being a terrorist or a terror suspect, um, they can collect the metadata of your phone calls, uh, emails, texts, so on and so forth. Necessar they can't necessarily read the contents of them, but they can at least see um, the email addresses you're sending to, the phone numbers you're calling to, the countries of origin for those things. Um, so it is this idea of metadata. But this sort of operates under the assumption or, or a lie we like to tell ourselves is they can't actually collect the data itself. Um, and I think with recent news events, we're starting to see that that is becoming less and less true or, or that is most certainly a lie that we sort of tell ourselves, right? Where um, it's not just who we're calling, it's that the data that we put up, the things we like, the things we comment on, the things we share, those are becoming um, data that are being used to not only like target marketing to you, I mean, I know some of you have probably talked about wanting to buy a new pair of shoes, uh, or you've had those weird sort of like Amazon moments where you'll be talking about something with a friend and then all of a sudden there's a banner ad when you're looking at, at Instagram or something like that, where you like a couple of uh, products on Instagram, and boom, you have ads on your Facebook. This idea that, um, sure, if you're flagged as a terror suspect and you have your metadata, but Oftentimes, we're willingly opting in to this kind of data mining and this kind of what essentially is a kind of surveillance, right? And I think this is a difference of degree, right? I think oftentimes we sort of think, well, yeah, I opted into this and, and, and I'm not a terrorist, it's fine. I don't, you know, metadata, whatever. I'm not contacting Pakistan, I'm not contacting Iran, I'm not contacting Iraq, that sort of thing. But, um, that Amazon, that Facebook can do all of this, a private entity, what do you think NSA can do, right? Do you think, I mean, sure, they, they may or may not stop at metadata, but there seems to be a large scale sort of cynicism about government. And it's a matter of like when they can sort of flip that switch and move over from metadata to actual data mining, right? Um, so those are all sort of huge, sweeping examples of how um, panopticism and, and uh, can sort of permeate in culture. And I want to spend some more time with NSA and stuff, but I got another point to make first. Um, so via all of this sort of cultural structures that I was talking about, ultimately, um, Foucault sees this sort of panoptic structure and panoptic culture creating or working to create what he calls discipline. And we might think of discipline in terms of like spanking a child or, or punishing a child or um, you know, sending a person to prison if they violate laws, so on and so forth. But it works in sort of two ways. Ultimately, the goal of discipline is to create what Foucault calls docile bodies. That's something you want to remember. Docile bodies. So on the one hand, there is discipline in the more traditional sense of like military discipline, police discipline, uh, where we're really talking about the regimenting of a person's life, of their diet, of their exercise, that sort of regimented life of like the military creates discipline, creates obedience, creates a chain of command that allows orders to be followed. There's no question, there's no, uh, at any given point, we know that orders will be followed within the military through that strict regiment, right? So it is a, on the one hand, a regimenting that creates discipline. And, you know, if you're very studious, you have a very tight schedule, uh, this isn't just military, is the point. The idea that, like, I'm going to be in the library from 11 to 3 every day, and this makes me productive. I'm going to go to the gym after. I'm going to eat this uh, very specific meal. I'm going to meal prep, blah, 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 blah. All that kind of regimenting creates a kind of discipline. So it's not just police, but this idea of regimenting makes discipline on the one hand, right? But on the other, um, Things that are a lot less regimented can still serve to create a docile body of, of following rules and regulations 
um, and essentially working to instill an ideology, right? So this is the, the extreme end where it is very, you know, you sign up for the military, you know you have to follow the rules, you have to follow the chain of command. Over here, like RSAs, essentially. Over here, though, are more your ISAs, where you do have systems of morality being imposed um, via school, via church, via family, via media, blah, 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 blah. It creates a certain kind of discipline wherein we know not to follow the rule, or we know not to break the rules to the point that we might warn our friends not to talk about bombs, weapons, something like that, because government might be listening. Um, and that's where we're getting to this idea of self-perpetuation, wherein um, we become monitors of one another's behavior and, and as such end up being an active agent of disciplining one another. And that's Foucault's idea here is um, as these mechanisms of surveillance become dispersed and spread out, we become agents of surveillance as well, whether or not we know it. Um, so again, it's the idea of stepping back and thinking about the things we do every day, um, but really sort of reframing it, seeing how it plays into these larger ideological and, and structures of power. Um, so, Yes, and uh, so I think the, the big, one of the biggest takeaways that I don't know if we really talked about, um, and I outlined it, but showing how this discipline is created via uh, the dispersal of surveillance, the dispersal of power and control over those cultural institutions. How something that starts in the ISA functions essentially the same way in the ISA side of things. Um, but ultimately it emerges out of this kind of power and out of this kind of surveillance. So, I imagine that some of you, as I've been sort of up here raving like a lunatic, like I usually do, um, especially when talking about like NSA, like you have nothing to hide. I don't either. As far as I know, I'm not on any sort of uh, watch list, right? I don't think my metadata is being collected or anything like that. So why, do I, why should I worry? Why do I have anything to hide? Well, um, this, this is the whole idea of like surveillance versus privacy, right? And we know that this is being conducted by both public and private entities. Both government and business entities are collecting our web activity in order to advertise to us and all that. And so like, sure, that might be benign, but um, I would suggest if you haven't really followed or looked into this idea uh, or this new story that's been coming out about Cambridge Analytica, um, wherein we're seeing this might have long-term effects in terms of swaying a lot. This uh, Russia 2016, but if there is a firm and agency in England claiming they have such ability to sway elections and have swayed multiple elections, 2016 America aside, if it's true, um, or even acknowledging the possibility that something like this could happen, then I think that we're all sort of involved and we're all sort of invested in this because the private data that we give to private entities like Amazon, like Facebook, like Instagram, like um, the Hogwarts survey that apparently was sold to Cambridge Analytica, you know, any kind of that data, anytime we check and accept the terms and conditions of an iPod or of Facebook or of a game like a Candy Crush, what we're doing is feeding, you know, data. We're, we're uh, giving up our privacy that may have those long-term effects of swaying elections. Um, and so that's where it becomes interesting to me is the idea that because I played Candy Crush or because I fell into this school of Hogwarts, this data went to a very large database um, where it was sort of collated and aggregated with you know, millions of other data sets in order to build particular voter profiles. And this is the Cam Cambridge Anal Analytica claim. Um, it was a BBC reporter for Channel 4 that really sort of like recorded the CEO making these claims. So I'll just 
lay them out as I understand them. I'm probably getting some of the details wrong, but um, like I said, sort of building these profiles and being able to target very specific voting districts that um, could sway one way or another. And uh, having that sort of voter profile for a particular area or region, what this firm claims to be able to do is generate news stories and content and give those to social media groups that would be active in that voting precinct, distribute that, get it circulating, and ultimately sway the outcome of the election. And their overarching claim is that they swayed the 2016 election via targeting very specific swing state districts um, with that kind of generated content that would uh, sway particular precincts and ultimately, again, their claim, Cambridge Analytica claims that they engineered um, Hillary Clinton, Clinton winning the popular vote, but Donald Trump winning the electoral college. I'm not endorsing it either way, just, you know, trying to be clear there, but if a person and if a firm can claim to do such a thing, then I think we all have a sort of investment in the kinds of data that we put out into the cloud, right? Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm being a little bit hypocritical. I like, I have a smartphone, you know, I, I play video games on my phone, I use social media, so I'm not trying to talk to you from a high horse, but, um, this sort of surveillance that we opt into. We self-perpetuated by liking our Instagram photos and all that sort of stuff. But the claim here being um, that kind of data can be used for rhetorical ends, like being able to collect and collate all that becomes a rhetorical strategy. It becomes something that's rhetorically effective because with those kinds of voter profiles, those kinds of demographic uh, information and psychographic information, um, you actually have people sort of placing content rhetorically and hoping that circulates in such a way to sway something as large as international elections. Um, so it's something that like we're sort of opting into our own panopticon because we like to get those fake internet points and like to feel that sort of rush and, and reward of social media. Um, so it is something that's efficient because we do it ourselves. We aren't even being coerced into this. Um, it's automatic because, well, it's an algorithm, right? I mean, everybody's mad at Mark Zuckerberg right now, but uh, ultimately, this was sort of an algorithm and, and people that are collecting this. We don't know who the sort of shady characters twirling their mustaches are, but theoretically, they might be there. We don't know. Anonymous, because we don't know, and self-perpetuating because we opt into it. So looking at those four sort of points of how power perpetuates itself, right? Both through ISAs and emerging out of our ISAs. Um, that was the point I wanted to make and how it actually does become pertinent and relevant, even if we feel like we have nothing to hide. Um, just the things that we're doing out in the open can be taken and used for rhetorical, for someone else's rhetorical benefit, ultimately. And I think that's pretty interesting. I think it's pretty scary at the same time. Uh, so I hope it at least makes you think, right? That's the whole idea. I'm not telling you to put on a tinfoil hat. I don't think you have to do that. I think you just need to be conscious of how um, you're engaging with uh, content online as well as being wary of the kinds of information that you put out um, to the point of like, you know, I know it might be a moot point right now, but uh, you know not to have like pictures of you partying on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, because job interviewers are going to try and find that information out. So even keeping that profile um, for the purposes of business, the idea that job interviewers have a right to surveil you in such a way that if you're doing things that uh, the company doesn't approve of, then you're able to be fired or not even hired to begin with. Um, so it's not just crazy, you know, worldwide election conspiracy theories. There are sort of immediate benefits for you. This idea that um, private entities have the right to engage in surveillance on your activity. It's pretty interesting. Um, and again, it's just one of those things like if you start with it, it seems pretty benign. Sure, prison, I'll never go to prison. But expanding outward, you see how this starts to really intersperse and, and permeate our lives. Um, 
So let me check my notes. I think we're good. Um, so I wanted to give you a sense of where we're headed. Uh, so as a way of, of looking at what um, RSI, RSAs and ISAs are capable of uh, within one specific realm, not only blending sort of the prison system, but all the other uh, media ISAs, education, uh, we're going to be screening the Netflix documentary named Title 13th. Um, so it's about an hour and 40 minutes long. And what I would have liked to have done is watch a portion of it on Tuesday when we would have met uh, and then finish it on Thursday. But I think what's going to have to end up happening is uh, I'd like to ask a favor. Uh, if you have access to a Netflix account, if you could watch maybe the first uh, 30 minutes or so of 13th before Thursday, I would like you to do that. But if you can't, if you don't have access to Netflix, please let me know. Um, because I don't want to make it a requirement if someone can't watch it. So I just need to know if someone doesn't have access to Netflix. And if not, uh, I can either sort of change the password on my account for you to watch it, or um, we may just end up sort of shifting the schedule around a little bit and we'll watch the first 75 minutes on Thursday and then finish it out on Tuesday and then just take the rest of the time to discuss. Um, so I'm sort of up in the air of how this plays out, but to give you a sense of where we're going and why we're looking at this is on the one hand, I think it's a very concrete, material, visual implication and argument about how these two things function together, RSAs and ISAs. But it also sort of makes us turn and think about how these sort of relationships and structures of power come to affect um, demographics and how they create certain kinds of hierarchies along the lines of race, class, and gender. Um, so ultimately, we are sort of turning toward what this looks like in terms of racism, sexism, classism. And so uh, I think it should be pretty interesting. Um, I'll post some questions uh, along with my notes in this video that I want to guide your viewing of 13th because there's a lot of rhetoric happening within it. And it's also a rhetorical argument in and of itself. So I think um, there are a lot of different layers that I want us to think with that I want us to discuss when we're talking about the movie, when we're watching the movie, but ultimately um, that's where we're headed and that's the rationale for it. Uh, we might have to talk a little bit about Bakhtin to refresh. I know you're probably tired of me talking about Bakhtin, but all roads lead to him, uh, so one of my colleagues says. Anyway, um, thank you very much for putting up with me. Uh, I know it's less than ideal, but I, like I said, didn't want to leave y'all hanging, and we're at that point in the semester where we can't really move anything around. We're running out of time. We got a lot of it. So thank you very much. I'll make notes available uh, for today for this lecture. I will um, put up the questions to discuss 13th, and please let me know if you uh, won't be able to access Netflix and be able to watch that first 30 minutes of the film 13th. Um, thank you all very much. Thank you for your patience. Uh, I know you're not mad about not having to, you know, coming in uh, tomorrow at 3.35, but uh, thank you very much, and I'll see you on Thursday, unless you hear differently from me. Goodbye.